morning, world changers. Good morning, church of the living God. Good morning, hope bringers. Glory carriers, that's who you are. So great to be with you this morning. We are continuing our Encounter God series in which we examine the attributes of God and our hope is that every single one of you will encounter God in a greater measure and that the friends and family that you bring along to church would encounter him perhaps for the first time and that God would be glorified, that, that we would know him better, that the, that mind-blowing goodness of God that we sang about today would become a very present reality in our lives. So, Father, I pray that as we preach today, Lord God, that you would, you would indeed pour out your Spirit. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Holy Spirit, fill us. Lord God, we don't want to leave here the same. Lord God, we came here for a reason. Meet us. Meet us. Lord, I, I speak right now to every fear in our heart, and I silence you. I say you will not live here. Lord God, I speak to every pride in our hearts, and I silence you. I say you will not live here. Holy Spirit, we open ourselves, we open our minds, and we say, come and speak to us. Come and speak to us, that you may be glorified, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Have you ever tried to manipulate God? I have. I've specialized in three methods. My first method is the good girl method. And in this method, I am really good. I make my bed every morning. I pray longer than I've ever prayed before every day. I'm kind to everyone, even the people I don't like. I, pers- I even make dinner every night. Yeah. You want to catch me on this good girl moments. And after I've done it for as long as I can bear, I go before the Lord and I say, Lord, you cannot deny me. Here are my requests. You cannot deny me. I'm usually met by thundering silence. (laughs) Someone shouting out, it must be low chilling. My second method is the fury. This involves lots of shaking my fist at heaven. It it involves loud shouting of scripture. It involves demanding that God be true to his word. And as I have done this and exhausted all my energy, I place my request before him and I say again, you cannot deny me. Again, I am met with thundering silence. My last method that I particularly specialize in (laughs) is called the lament. There are two versions. The first one is the dramatic version. And this involves me throwing myself on the bed, (laughs) crying out about how terrible my life is, about how bad things are, and that if God really loved me, he would just do this thing for me. Then there is the silent version. In this version, I just ignore God. I have a pouty look on my face, and I just don't talk to him. And then after a certain amount of time, I go before him and I say, God, if you want to restore the relationship with me, just this one thing, that's all I ask. I'm not sure if you've ever done any of these, but I feel like the person sitting to the left or the person on the right of you probably has. (laughs) And have you read the Psalms? Have you read the Psalms? I'm so delighted. In there I find myself. David clearly knew what it was to be human. It seems like for millennia, 
Mankind has been trying this. But it turns out that God is not manipulatable. And this is good news. This is good news. So that means that a modification in our stance towards him is necessary. I'm trusting today will be that modification for all of us. I said that David had employed all those manipulative techniques. He did it with a righteous twist, which we're going to get to at the end, and I think it will help you. But today I want to talk about the aseity of God. The aseity of God. Yes, it's a real word. It's a real word. If you drop this word at dinner parties, people will think you are very, very smart. If you say it with a British accent, they will absolutely think you are a university professor. <laughs> but the aseity of God is a theologian's complicated way of telling you that God is self-sufficient. It comes from a Latin word, two Latin words, "asse," and it means that God comes from, one him, from himself. In other words, nothing adds to him. Nothing, no, nothing has ever contributed to the goodness of God. That he is fully himself. He is not in need of something from you or from creation or from anywhere. That he is fully God all the time. There is a... A particular scripture that I want to read to you. At first glance, you may say, what has this got to do with the aseity of God? But hang on, you'll see it. So Paul is going through one of his missionary journeys, and he comes to the great city of Athens. And Athens is a powerful city in the region. He goes into the, the marketplace, as is common with him, and he begins to preach Jesus. While he's in the marketplace, he is accosted by two groups of people. Again, you're going to be very smart by the end of this sermon. He is met by some Stoic philosophers and by some Epicurean philosophers. Turn to your neighbor and say Epicurean. Epicurean. just want to make sure you know how to pronounce it so you can drop it at particular times in your conversations. Stoic and Epicureans. Now the Stoics were like these hard-nosed, hardcore, self-denialists who believed that there was a spiritual realm that inhabited all the trees and the plants and the rocks. And if you just um, disciplined yourself hard enough, you would experience, you would comply with the spirit and experience kind of, I don't think you even experienced good. You just didn't die or you didn't have bad things. If if you were a Stoic today, you would be an intermittent faster. You, you would do CrossFit every day. And you would hug trees at every opportunity. These were, these were your discipline yourself tree huggers. Do we have any of you here today? <laughs> you know, I'm sure there are some, actually. Welcome. <laughs> the Epicureans were a little bit different. They didn't believe in God at all. And they were your pleasure seekers. They thought that you, you fully actualized yourself as a human being by finding pleasure. These were your fine dining, fashion week attendees. Build your social media profile people. Do we have any here? I think we do. Welcome. Welcome. Well, these two sets of people found what Paul had to say quite intriguing. And they grabbed him. The words used, is they took him by force, basically, to the kind of center of the, of the life of Athens, which was, are you ready? Areopagus. 
They took him to the Areopagus. I had to practice this word for quite a while, but there I got it. He took them to the, they took him to the Areopagus, which was the center of the life of Athens. It was the political center where the governance of Athens happens. It was also the religious center. Many temples to all the many, many Greek gods were there. And they took him there and they said, this is the place we debate new ideas. Come and debate with us. And we pick up the scripture when he is there in the Areopagus about to debate. One more thing I have to tell you so you understand the scripture is that, that the Athenians were very religious. They had many different gods. And many years before, there had been a plague in Athens. And so what they had done is they had sacrificed to all the gods and the plague had remained. So they figured there must be another god out there. So what they did is they took a whole flock of sheep, they let them go in Athens, and every time a sheep stopped, they built an altar to the unknown god and slaughtered the sheep there. And when they had gone through all the sheep and built all the altars to the unknown god, the plague stopped. So in their minds, they had the thought, there is another God that we don't know who stops plagues. And Paul is right there in the middle of this, and he begins the story. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Lord Jesus, bless your word in our lives. I want to call your attention to three phrases. The first one is, that the first one is coming up on your screen in a moment that god does not live in temples made by man now i want you to note what it does not say it does not say god does not live in temples it says he doesn't live in temples made by man because right from the beginning god lived in a temple you may not know this, but the first chapter of Genesis where he is ordering the creation, and then it says right at the end that on the seventh day he rested. That's actually temple language. So the ancient Near East people built temples, and then they invited a God that they felt was especially that they had chosen and thought would bless their nations, and they invited him to come and rest in their temple. They even sometimes put beds in there for him. So when God rested in the creation that he had made, to all of mankind at that time, it would have read this, all of creation is my temple and I dwell in it. Then we know in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul also saying to us, to Christians, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He said, you were bought with a price. You belong to God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God lives in temples he has made. You see, the Greeks felt like they could choose whichever God, choose or not choose, choose how they lived. They, they, could, they could determine their own future. They could choose this God or that God. But it turns out you don't choose your God. 
your God chooses you. The God of creation chooses you. So when we look at the satiety of God, the self-sufficiency of God, the truth is that we don't even get to choose him. He chooses us. And our response is either yes or no. You see, next slide, please. You see, God chooses. But the satiety of God means this, that he really doesn't need you. But the beauty is that he wants you. He doesn't need you, but he wants you. Guys, can you feel the weight just lifting from you? What would you do if tomorrow morning Bill Gates knocked on your front door? <laughs> I'm having some interesting things come flying back at me. But if Gil, Bill Gates knocked at your door and then he said to you, I'm starting a new company and I want you to be one of my employees. You're going to feel two things, I bet. First of all, you're going to feel extremely honored, I hope. Okay, if you don't feel honored, just imagine any other great entrepreneur standing in front of you. But the other thing you're going to feel is somewhat overwhelmed. But what if he then said to you, I am going to do most of the work myself. And anything I ask you to do, I'm going to help you. I mean, there's probably going to be a lot of zeros in your paycheck. So I think you're going to jump at that opportunity. But you see, this is how it is when God comes and chooses you. Yeah. He invites you into a place that is so beyond you. Yeah. So much more than you could ever accomplish as a mere human being. But he says, how about you come and you be associated with me? You be, you be my, the, the, a part of my giant, giant work that I'm doing on the earth. I will do most of the work and everything I ask you to do, I will help you. As Andrew said, as he closed worship, that's called grace. That's called grace. You see, God doesn't need you, but he chooses you. The next phrase I want to look at is, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives all to God mankind. God is not served by human hands. And in fact, he gives everything to us. You know, when God asks you to serve him, it's not about him. God doesn't ask you to serve him because somehow it makes him better or somehow it makes him feel gratified. God doesn't ask you to serve him because somehow he gets a kick out of it. God asks you to serve him because it benefits you. Just as God doesn't need you, he doesn't need your service. He doesn't need your worship. He doesn't even need your giving. He doesn't even need you to be kind to your neighbor. There goes my good girl routine. You see, God asks us to do those things because we need it. Because it makes us like him. How, how glorious is this thought? That in fact, the maker of the universe serves us. What kind of king, what kind of king washes the feet of his servants. What kind of king cooks his disciples food after they've been fishing all night? What kind of king comes and finds you when you lost? What kind of king 
weeps with you? What kind of king celebrates with you? What kind of king is this? His name is Jesus. You see, we don't serve God because it, it benefits him. We serve God because it benefits us and makes us like him. When we serve, it makes us like him. God serves. And even though he owes us nothing, God owes us nothing. There is nothing you have ever done or ever said that has contributed to his well-being. He owes you nothing. And yet, he gives you everything. He owes you nothing, but he gives you everything. What kind of king serves his people? His name is Jesus. And my friends, if that doesn't make you fall down in worship, I don't know. God, we worship you. Thank you. Thank you. The last phrase or sentence I want us to look at, he says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God. If you ever felt like a mistake, you should print the scripture up and put it on your wall. There are no mistakes in God's kingdom. He determined who you are, the color of, the, of your skin, your personality, your parents, the nation in which you are born, the time in which you are born. There are no mistakes. He chose you. He put you in the exact right place for what reason? That you would seek him. That the greatest prize of the universe would be yours. That you would know God. And that it didn't matter what your circumstances were because if you sought him and you got God, he changes circumstances. He makes things right. There is no mistake about who you are. And therefore, here goes my lament manipulation. There is no cause for self-pity in ever. Because you're in the right place at the right time, in the right circumstances, that you would seek God so that you could be found, that he could be found by you, so that you could live the fullness of his created destiny for you. You see, God determines. You think you've got your life so organized, but God is the one who determines your future. And some of the time when we're so frustrating, perhaps we're banging against a door that God has locked and shut because there is another door right to the other side that he has opened and he has determined this is the one that will bless you. You see, God's agenda for the world is absolutely certain. They're not even mistakes in your life. They're not even mistakes. There are no mistakes in the nations of the world. Even the most evil dictator, whether he likes it or not, must ultimately serve the purposes of God. God turns the hearts of rulers in his hand. And we see this through the ages. After empire, after empire, after empire, empire bowed its knee to Jesus Christ. You think there is some huge entity that's about to take over the world right now. I promise you that God's agenda is sure. It will bow to Jesus Christ. It will bow to Jesus Christ. You know, when I was on... Wits campus, trying to get a degree. Mostly I was finding Jesus and I got a degree. But one of the, the women who discipled me, amazing American missionary, she actually was in charge of campus and she, would, she was 
leading people to the Lord. She was going to campus and do evangelism. She was pastoring the students. She would go into the rezes and, and kind of have small groups and look after them. And she said to me shortly after I got saved, come on, Carol, come along with me and do this with me. It was kind of like a Bill Gates moment, you know? Because I knew, I, I don't even think I knew one scripture. I just, I don't even think I could have found John in the Bible. But I tagged along with her, and at every moment she told me to pray. And when I prayed, she said, fantastic, Carol. And really, it was just very ordinary. And we went around, and when people got saved, she got back. She would say, Carol and I saw these people saved. I had just sat there trembling in the corner while she did all the work. <laughs> You see, she had an agenda on the campus and she was working it, but she wrote me into her agenda. And you know, as, as she did that, I found myself learning how to run that agenda and I found myself growing and becoming a campus missionary. Yeah. All our campus min missionaries said, But you see, God has an agenda for the world. He doesn't need you, but he chooses you. And in so doing, he writes you into his agenda. He makes space for you in his agenda. And when he wraps this whole thing up, he is going to stand before all creation and say, look what we did. Why wouldn't you fall down and worship such a God? Paul concludes his speech and he, he says that God's overlooked all our ignorance, but now he commands us to repent. And he goes on and he says that, that there will come a time when he will indeed wrap up history and he will stand and, and we will all give account for what we have done with his choosing us. We will all give account of what we have done with the fact that he wrote us into his agenda. We will all give account of what we have done with the grace he has extended to us. But you know, God in Jesus Christ has done a magnificent thing. Is that Jesus came to show the world who God was. He was God himself showing the world who God is. And in so doing, we saw the goodness of God in action. As he went to the cross, it becomes apparent to us that God wants nothing but good for us. And in so doing, we see how good God is, that God wants good for us. And then Paul concludes his great speech with this, that he's given us assurance to all by raising him, Christ Jesus, from the dead. God, Jesus' life and death speak to us that God wants good for us Jesus' resurrection speaks that God always gets what he wants. That he has the power to bring about his desire on this earth. And that desire is for your good. As I conclude, I want to refer back to David, who wrote those psalms of lament, those psalms of fury, those good boy psalms. He didn't write good girl psalms, he wrote good boy psalms. But you know, interestingly enough, when he was writing those psalms, he always has this twist. He, he pours out his heart. He laments. You feel his anger. anger. You, feel, you feel his disappointment. You feel how he is he's trying to do everything to be right with God. And then we see an example in Psalm 13, in verse 5, he says, after he's lamented, you can read it yourselves. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You see, in that, in that process of just being real and raw and honest with God and being completely human with him, then he turns his attention to, to God and what God has done and God's goodness and God's greatness and the fact that I add nothing to God, but that God is good enough to write me into his agenda. God is good enough to want good for me, even though he doesn't need me. He has chosen me. He turns attention to the, these great truths and begins to worship. And in so doing, 
praying, he is changed. You see, the truth about prayer is that prayer does not change God. Prayer changes you. When you come to him, this great God who has always, from the beginning of time, determined good for you, brings you into his presence. He allows you to open his heart, your heart, and when it's open, he begins surgery on it. He changes you, and he makes you into the kind of person that can carry his glory, that can carry the good that he has always determined for you. He teaches you to ask for the right things. He teaches you to be the right person. And as we partner with him, he does amazing works through us. And then he stands at the end of your life and said, look what we done. And you know, from the start to the finish, it was all God. It was all God. You just said yes. You see... Even when we don't understand, we can trust. Because God is completely self-sufficient, absolutely himself. He doesn't need you, but he chooses you. You owe him nothing, but he gives you everything. His agenda is sure, but he's made space for you in his agenda. We even when we don't understand, we can trust because God raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. Amen.